The following anecdote is told about William James. After a lecture on cosmology and the structure of the solar system, James was approached by a little old lady who told him, that's a very interesting idea, sir, but you are incorrect. The earth is carried on the back of a turtle. James, not wanting to insult the little old lady, said to her, okay, ma'am, but what does that turtle stand on? And she said, ah, you can't fool me. I know you're very clever, but it's turtles all the way down. That anecdote illustrates two competing cosmologies for our own world. In the first one is the scientific cosmology of the solar system and its structure. And the second is that we are in fact being carried by a turtle and it is turtles all the way down. And today I want to talk about creating a fantasy cosmology for your world. Welcome to another episode of Just In Time Worlds. My name is Marie Mullaney. If this kind of world building content interests you, please do consider subscribing. And if you want to support me in making these videos, keep watching till the end and I will tell you how you can support me in creating more videos. Okay, let's get cracking with fantasy cosmologies. The most obvious impact of cosmology is how was the world created? What was the beginning of this universe? It is important here to note that what people believe and what the truth is may not be the same. I'll illustrate this by drawing on the LARPing world I created with a few other people. First, the truth of the world's creation. We went with a very basic creation story where death was the primary mover of our universe. She had killed the previous universe and as she was switching off the lights and closing the door, a children's book escaped and with it came a tendril of power. And from that book was born all the creatures, the twelve elemental planes and Tiana, the world that lies at the center of the universe. The races of Tiana had different stories though, each according to their culture. So let's take a look at two contrasting stories. The Beata are a bird people who live quite short lives, and this was their origin story. The sun travelled through the darkness, and he knew what it was to be lonely. The sun rested, and in his loneliness he cried, and his tears mingled with the darkness and became the silver moon. And the moon went to the sun and asked him why he cried. The sun knew that he was alone no more, and his tears dried. But the moon was too young to handle the sun's fiery regard, and so the moon asked the darkness to build it a shield. The darkness took stuff from itself, the moon and the sun, and fashioned the world. The sun and the moon circled the world, and it was good. But death, who walked the darkness, was angry, for the sun had ignored her, and she wished to have companions too. And so she cast her power at the world. But the darkness wished to protect its creation. So the darkness absorbed and altered death's power. And from the world, life sprung forth. First was the long-lived races such as the dwarves and the elves. But the shield of darkness grew weaker. And those of shorter lifespans were born. Finally, the Beata emerged and darkness knew that their lives would be all too brief. So he gave them a special gift. They would know not one life, but many, traveling from life to death, to life and death again, until their spirits had found true meaning and satisfaction, and were ready to rest eternally. Now contrast this with the Tsar, who are a cat people, who have a high degree of bloodlust. Here is their origin story. In the beginning there was nothing but the dream. From the dream came all things and all people. One day, from the dream came a dream of fire, and the dream was the people called the Ursar. The Ursar were fearsome warriors and fought like nothing before or since. The Ursar fought and enslaved all the people they met. It was not long before all that was named had been conquered. But though all the world was theirs, the Ursar could not stop fighting, and they started fighting each other. This war they also won, and in the end none were left. Their dream of fire had burned too brightly, and they had burnt themselves out. 
the embers of the Ursar mixed with the blood they had spilled, and from the dream came a dream of fire and blood, and the dream was the people called the Sar who came to live in Asula. The Sar do not fight as hard or burn as brightly, but the Sar also do not burn out. So you can see quite clearly here how different cultures came up with different stories to explain the various planes and magic and how those planes and magic influenced their cultures. You can see that they have elements of the original creation, but they are changed to fit the culture of the people telling the stories. The key lesson is, consider the actual creation of your world and then consider how different cultures have interacted with that creation and the stories and myths they tell about their creation. If you'd like advice on the creation of myths, I did make a video, How to Myth, which you can check out in the information cards. So that's how a creation story is impacted by cosmology. Now let's turn our attention to the divine. I do have to issue a spoiler warning here. I am going to reference John Gwain's novel, Shadow of the Gods. So if you have not read it and you do want to, please do use the chapters in the description to skip on to the origins of biology. Okay, let's get cracking with how John Gwain's cosmology impacts on his divine. The old gods were ancient beings that descended from the great snake god Snaka and fought each other in a massive battle, coming close to destroying the world. The bits and pieces of the gods' physical bodies that remain grant power to those who own these items. The books are set after the world's equivalent of Ragnarok and the old gods are dead, providing it with a fascinating cosmology where the gods probably had a hand in the creation of the world but the legends that are told about them hinge on the gods having almost destroyed the world and each other. The people who remain want nothing more to do with the gods. The gods are definitely seen as the bad guys by the normal humans who now inhabit the world. A really great use of this broken post-apocalyptic cosmology is in how the tainted are handled. The tainted are the descendants of the gods, and they have what amounts to godly magical talents. They are feared by normal people and are enslaved. The way they are forced to obedience is through special collars that are imbued with ruin magic, but are also forged from the chain that bound the wolf god Ufrir. So the cosmology of the world, the battle which led to the apocalypse, directly impacts on the current shape of the world's culture, the control of the children of the gods, the tainted. The key lesson is, decide how your divine forces feature in your cosmology. Did they create the world? Were they also created? Did their battles influence the world, leaving scars on its surface and changing the nature of the people who inhabit the world? Whatever course you choose, make sure that your cosmology and your divine forces are in alignment and make sense within the context of your universe. But cosmology is more than just the divine or your creation story. It also impacts your biology, your fauna and flora. I have two videos that already speak to this that are information cards now. The one is fauna and flora in a fantasy world. The other one is my interview with James Sutter where we discuss using evolution in a fantasy world. So I'm not going to repeat everything that's been said in those videos. Instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you two practical examples drawing on my world, the Sangwheel Chronicles, to show you how I created animals that are tied to my magic system and animals that are based on evolution. I should note that these animals don't feature in Book 1, The Hidden Blade, but do feature in Book 2, The Ducal Heir. In my world, magic is fueled by Elamar, which is a cosmological force. There are a few rare animals that can access the Elamar also, one of which is the Masorax. The Masoraxi are giant snakes native to the Shidan Mashada Desert in the Kisangi continent. They are massive, standing more than the height of two men at the thickest part of their bodies. A human habir, or mage, can tame a Masorax by allowing his Elamar to mingle with that of the Masorax. If the Habir and the Masorax are compatible, 
they will form a bond sufficient to allow the habiyir to ride the masarox. If the masarox and the habiyir are not compatible, the habiyir had best flee as fast as possible. Masaroxi are fast and deadly when irritated. Masaroxi are naturally evolved animals, though, so why did they evolve this ability to use their elamar? The reason for that is found in their prey, the yaneri. These large, flat creatures are invisible to the naked eye and make their home in the same desert. They are capable of moving just below the desert sand, leaving only their eyes and the occasional sand trail exposed. Their only predator is the giant masarox who hunt them using their elamars to enhance their sensory capabilities. The sting of the yaneri is poisonous to animals, turning the liquid in their veins to a gel that is eaten by the yaneri. So, I used my cosmological force, the manipulation of the elamar, to provide greater sensory abilities, in combination with evolutionary forces, the need to eat the yaneri, to create the masaroxi snakes. And that's the key lesson. Make sure your fauna and flora work within your cosmology in a way that feels natural to that cosmology. Don't just give random powers to animals and plants. Stick to powers that make sense in your cosmology. So in speaking about these animals of mine, I did also touch on magic systems and how your cosmology impacts on magic systems. But I can't really talk about cosmology and magic systems without referencing the Cosmere and Brandon Sanderson. The Cosmere is the greater universe in which Brandon Sanderson's fantasy books take place. The books take place on different shard worlds, and each of these worlds is set in the same small galaxy within the Cosmere universe. All of the books share a single creation myth, though not all cultures are aware of it, a single cosmology, and they are connected by an overarching story. The part of the Cosmere that I want to focus on today is the influence that the Cosmere has on magic. Each world in the Cosmere has its own magic system based on the intention of the shard or shards that inhabit that world, hence the name shard world. For the sake of explanation, let's take the example of Alamancy versus surge binding. Allomancy is the ingestion of metals to provide magical energy which the mage can then use to achieve certain magical effects depending on the metal ingested. As an example, you could ingest tin and this would allow you to enhance your physical senses. Surge binding, by contrast, is a magic system that embraces ten types of surges which are the fundamental forces of nature. By using stormlight, the surge binder can bind with these surges and affect nature through magic. As an example, you could bind to gravitational forces, reversing your gravitational pull and thus fly. Both of these magic systems exist in a single universe along with quite a few others. And what allows them all to coexist like this is simple. The shards and their intention on the worlds that they inhabit heavily skew the magic system in the direction that the shards want. The key lesson is this. Make sure that your magic system and your cosmology are complementary. If your magic system is divorced from the cosmological forces that shape your world, it's going to feel very unnatural. Now, it is possible to tell a story about that. Maybe the story is why magic and the cosmology don't work together. But then that is the core focus of your story and you need a great reason for creating the magic system and the cosmology to be at right angles to each other. So how do you apply all of this to your world? How do you build a cosmology for your world? Firstly, consider your actual creation of your world. Then consider what your various cultures believe. What are the variations on this creation story that they tell each other? Let your magic system flow naturally from your cosmology. Make sure that your cosmology and your magic system work together to form an engaging experience. Fit your biology into your cosmology in a way that makes sense both magically and through evolutionary forces. And lastly, don't kill yourself over doing it. You do not have to define the entirety of your cosmology up front 
you only need to have enough to get going with. You need to have enough to have a flavor of your world, not so much that you can write the whole Silmarillion when you're getting started. And that is my take on creating a cosmology for your fantasy world. If you have enjoyed this episode, please do hit that thumbs up button. If you would like to support me in making more videos like this, please visit my page at ko-fi.com forward slash just in time worlds. You can buy me a cup of coffee there for one euro or you can purchase a membership that gives you all kinds of monthly benefits. And you can also engage with me if you want to help me build out your world in a one-on-one -on -one session. I am also in the middle of writing an epic fantasy series and you can purchase the first book, The Hidden Blade. It is currently on pre-order at Amazon, link in the description down below. I hope to see you soon for another episode of Just In Time Worlds.